Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Emily May. I'm a pollinator conservation specialist with the pesticide program at Circe's. It's almost the start of fall. The equinox is this Saturday, so it's hard to choose among seasons, but fall is a great season and among my favorites, spooky season. So I'm excited to share with you today some information on caring for pollinator habitat as we go into fall and winter, how that might look different from what you're doing in your vegetable gardens as opposed to your pollinator gardens. We're going to talk about what happens to pollinators and other insects in the fall and winter because understanding the seasonality of all of their life cycles is key to supporting their populations all the way around the year. And then we're going to dive into sort of fall gardening tasks and how you can adapt your gardening practices to build resilience into the system. Let's see. So you're all here because you're already familiar with Xerces, but since we were founded in 1971 as an organization of butterfly scientists, our mission has expanded to protecting all invertebrates and their habitats, not just butterflies. And I'm based in Vermont in the Champlain Valley. I've been with Xerces since 2015, but we have staff all around the country, over 70 staff in over 20 states. And before I start, I just wanted to give a shout out and thank you to Xerces partners, including our members, our volunteers who do outreach and gather data, other supporters and our collaborators at universities and agencies and growers, people like you who are interested in doing more to protect invertebrates in your neighborhoods. So we can't do what we do without you. Thank you. So here's an outline for what we're going to talk about over the next hour. I'm going to do a quick introduction, then we're going to dive into fall and winter habitat, including insect life histories, leaving the leaves and the logs and the limbs, and then walking through how you would manage standing vegetation for birds and stem nesting bees. We're going to talk about fall gardening tasks, both for pollinator habitat and for vegetable gardens, and then and by reflecting on some garden goals and intentions and how gardening for wildlife can be a little bit of a paradigm shift, but a happy one. And then we'll open it up for questions at the end. So let's dive in. I figure since you're here, you're already aware of the issues that insects and other invertebrates are facing and their ecological importance. So I will try and keep this intro pretty short and sweet. Insects might be small, but they are incredibly important. They are helping to break down dead plants and animals and return nutrients into the soil. They're offering free natural pest control services, keeping the balance of potential pests in check. They're the basis for the whole animal food web. They're turning plants into food for other animals. And they help plants reproduce from trees and shrubs to wildflowers to the veggies in our gardens but they're also facing tough times due to climate change, pesticide use, loss of their habitats. So what can we do to support them? Gardening for wildlife can help, everyone can contribute. And we're gonna to talk today a lot about resilient gardening, which isn't just about creating beautiful gardens, it's about fostering habitats that support a diverse range of species, from pollinators uh, like bees and butterflies to birds and beneficial insects. So all of these animals aren't just passing visitors to our gardens, they're vital components of a, a whole ecosystem. So we can help protect biodiversity and buffer effects of climate change in our communities through our gardening practices. So what, is, what does resilient gardening look like? Resilient gardening looks like a focus on biodiversity and on creating habitat for wildlife. Planting lots of different species of plants mean you're, means that you're more likely to attract and support a diversity of insects and other wildlife. Choosing a wide variety of, of native plants to support local wildlife and provide food and shelter. I don't mean that you have to only, only plant native plant species, but if you're gardening for native wildlife, native plants are generally the best species to focus on as high value plants. Um, because of the deep relationships that exist between species that have lived together for many lifetimes. So in our, in our gardens, our resilient gardens, we're embracing ecological pest management, uh, lending a hand to beneficial insects so that they can lend a hand to us to help maintain the balance. And then we're help creating gardens that have a little bit of something for all seasons, from spring blossoms to winter seed heads, so that we can provide food for these birds, like these goldfinches on sunflowers. So before we go any further, this is gonna be a refresher for I think all of you, but let's remind ourselves about some of the key elements for pollinator and other wildlife habitat. 
So it's, it's helpful to be grounded in how our gardens are supporting pollinators throughout their entire life cycle with food, so nectar and pollen, larval host plants for butterflies that have something all year uh, throughout the seasons. Nectar, uh, nest and overwintering sites, so shelter, nesting and overwintering sites, and then protection from pesticides and other disturbances. And those disturbances can include fall garden cleanup. When we garden for pollinators and provide that base, we are supporting way more than just pollinators. When you have diverse native habitat, you're supporting a big diversity of predatory and parasitic insects that provide biological control uh, of insects that have the potential to become pests. So the more complex that bottom layer, the plant community is, the more complex our insect networks and communities are gonna be, the more complex and more likely that we're gonna have higher level predators like birds or lizards or other animals, and the less likely that you're gonna see big outbreaks of any one species. So I just wanna zoom in here beyond flowers. You know, Oftentimes when we think about our pollinator gardens, we're thinking about what flowers they have, what they look like, what they're providing in the spring and summer and early fall. But pollinator life cycles don't stop in September. Nesting and overwintering habitat is a critical contributor to the overall annual life cycle of these insects. As Doug Talamis has said, the biggest threat to overwintering insects doesn't come from the weather, generally speaking. It comes from us as we're striving to clean up our flower beds, our lawns, and our meadows. And a little knowledge about how insects spend the winter can help us avoid killing them unintentionally. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the protection of nesting and overwintering habitat today. We'll talk more about that than about floral resources, although we will talk about that a bit too. So let's talk about where other whether where insects and other invertebrates go in the winter the vast majority overwinter or spend the winter right where they spent all summer just less active and more hidden so invertebrates are relying on fallen leaves a lot of times or other debris to cover and insulate them from the elements and so whatever your landscape is you can help ensure that there are resources available for that nesting and overwintering these are luna moths, and this is an example of an insect that disguises their cocoons like dried leaves, blending in with real leaves. Luna, luna moths are found in a, really all deciduous forests around Eastern North America, as far north as Canada, as far south as Mexico, and they occur in several generations a year. Luna moth eggs are about the size of a pinhead, really, really small, uh, coated in this brown adhesive that helps them cling to plants. So as winter approaches and leaves start falling, the pupa of the luna moth will overwinter hidden in their cocoons in the leaf litter. This is a morning cloak butterfly, which is a large butterfly with yellow white wing edges and sort of velvety brown. It's one of the very first butterflies that you'll see in the spring up here in the Northeast US. It emerges on some of the first warm days. Um, sometimes there's still snow on the ground when this butterfly comes out. These morning cloak adults actually hibernate through the New England winter. So different insects overwinter as different life stages and the morning cloak overwinters as an adult. Um, so several species of butterfly have the ability to basically produce an antifreeze agent, uh, glycol compounds that stop ice crystals from forming in their blood so they can get super cooled without actually freezing. Um, so morning cloaks will basically find a sheltered place like a crevice or under a bark or in the leaves or a wood pile to spend the winter. And they'll, they'll have that sort of super cooling ability without actually freezing. This is a red banded hair streak butterfly, which lays their eggs on fallen oak leaves. And then those oak leaves become the first food of the caterpillars when they emerge. So this is a Southeastern species where I am in Vermont, we have the coral hair streak, which is similar, which lays its eggs on twigs or in leaf litter at the base of cherry trees. We have the hickory hair streak, which overwinters as eggs on the leaves of hickories and ash and oak trees. And those caterpillars hide in leaf litter during the day and then emerge at night to feed on leaves and fruit. This is a tiger swallowtail chrysalis. So swallowtail butterflies will disguise their chrysalises as dried leaves, which blends in with real leaves. And they overwinter as a chrysalis in a state of diapause, like an insect version of hibernation. 
the larvae that experience the shortening days of late summer will enter diapause after after going into their pupal stage. Those pupil, pupae will stop developing at that point and wait for increasing day length and warmer temperatures to come out of their diapause or hibernation. Um, so like the, the morning cloak butterfly that overwinters an adult, these pupa also produce those kind of antifreeze compounds that keep them from freezing. This is a sort of similar one, a common buckeye butterfly that's attached to a seed head. And I mostly put this in because it's just so beautiful and well blended into standing vegetation. The species doesn't actually overwinter in the Northeast. It's migratory like the monarch and the final Northern generation heads south in late summer and early fall, but it's just so pretty and cool. You might be looking for one of these in your gardens around now. This is the great spangled fritillary butterfly, which is a large and very pretty fritillary butterfly. It spends the winter as a newly hatched caterpillar that's hidden in leaf litter. Uh, the mom lays eggs uh, near or sometimes at the base of violets in the fall. Um, and then the caterpillar emerges from its egg, but doesn't eat the violets until the next spring. So it spends the winter as the caterpillar. And then as the violet leaves start emerging in the spring, the caterpillar starts to eat and grow and continue its, its life cycle. Um, and the great spang spangled fritillaries uh, secret weapon for survival is extreme secrecy. So the caterpillar is hidden in fallen leaves during the day and only returns to its food plants to feed at night. So it's very hard to spot and I wasn't even able to find a photograph of the caterpillar to use for this presentation. And this is a uh, polyphemus moth. You might recognize this one. It's stunning. It's named after the giant cyclops from Greek mythology who had a single round eye in the middle of his forehead. This one is emerging in May in the Midwest from its silk cocoon. So this moth has one brood a year north of Pennsylvania and two south of south of Pennsylvania. And the females are laying their eggs on a variety of different deciduous trees, including oaks and maples and willows and birch. These caterpillars pillars are solitary. So they're eating the whole leaf and snipping it off at the base, um, which might be a kind of protective measure against predators that look for leaf damage. So they take the whole leaf off so they don't see the damage. Um, and what do these, what do these moth cocoons look like? They look like this, very much like a leaf. There's a lot of different cocoon placement behaviors in silk moths if you're looking for cocoons in your landscape. So you could find a cocoon attached like this one by one or two silk peduncles or stalks to a twig. Um, this peduncle could be weak, allowing the cocoon to fall down into leaf litter or strong enough that the cocoon can remain on the tree all winter. It can also be like this attached lengthwise to a twig so the cocoon doesn't fall down during the winter, or it could be just in the leaf litter um, or spun on the ground. So this is just a wonderful disguise uh, for overwintering polyphemus moth. This is another camouflaged moth. This is a six spotted gray, which feeds on dog bane as larvae. So if you think about all of those hundreds of species of brown moths and butterflies, these are the species that might be using leaves for cover and shelter. But there are lots of other arthropods, other animals that need the cover and shelter from leaves. So I don't know if, how, how uh, well this is coming through, but if you can spot the leaf litter crab spider in here, they look a lot like a pebble, very brilliantly camouflaged. There it is in case you needed the, the additional help. And about the vast majority of overwintering spiders are spending the winter under leaf litter or in soil or under bark at various stages of their life cycles. So a lot of them overwinter in egg sacs, which are very hardy, but they can also overwinter um, some as spiderlings or immature adults um, with their legs pulled in tightly to their bodies. And a lot of spiders like the butterfly species I mentioned before, uh, many of these overwintering spiders are building up glycol compounds like antifreeze compounds in their tissues as they get exposed to gradual cooling temperatures in the fall, which allows them to get very cold without actually freezing. Spiders are some of our best fighters when it comes to ecological pest control. So maintaining functional diversity of spiders with all those different prey and hunting strategies is something that we want for our yards and gardens to help keep potential pest insects in check. Another group of beneficial insects that often live or use leaf litter and soil are ground beetles. This is a common and very diverse group of insects found in leaf litter. 
We have many dozens of genera and hundreds of species of ground beetles in the US, just an incredible diversity. And these beetles are really important biological control agents in ag and garden systems. They control insect pests. They also eat weed seeds. So they are sort of double, double duty. They consume all kinds of soft bodied insects, including caterpillars, beetle grubs, fly maggots, ants, aphids, slugs, you name it. <laughs> Um, they also consume, some species will eat seeds of things like lamb's quarter and velvet leaf, crabgrass, amaranth, things that you don't love pulling out of your gardens all the time. So they can be an important contributor to weed control as well. And most of them are overwintering as adults in the soil, but the larvae of many species live on the soil surface and leaf litter. And these insects really do benefit from some mess. This is the, the second to last insect life cycle I'll talk through before we move into a little bit more about gardening and leaving the leaves. But these are walking sticks. These, this is the northern walking stick, really just an incredible looking insect. Um, they also depend on leaf litter at some point in, in their life cycle. But these are mostly wingless insects that graze on the leaves of a variety of different deciduous trees. And they don't generally move very far. They don't cover a lot of ground. Um, you don't see damage like you might from spongy moths or other forest pests. Um, these are food for a variety of birds as well as, as mammals. And northern walking sticks mature in late summer into early fall. And the females will drop more than 100 eggs from the tops of trees that they're living on. So the eggs are falling to the ground from the tops of trees where they're going to overwinter in the leaf litter until spring. Um, and I don't have a picture of the egg, but the, the egg looks just like a seed. And so a portion of the outside of a walking stick egg is edible, the northern walking stick, sort of mimicking a similar area on the outside of plant seeds that depend on ants for distribution. So ants will haul seeds and they will also haul walking stick eggs back into their nest. They'll eat the edible part and then they'll toss or bury the rest into their waste heap. So in the spring, walking sticks can hatch safely below ground and then walk out of the ant hill. So these are some pretty amazing interactions that can happen where we're not seeing them. Just know that they're happening around you from the tops of your trees down into your, your ant hills. So this is the last one we'll talk about. This is bumblebees, some of our favorite insects. So this is a beautiful graphic that shows the full life cycle of bumblebees, starting with the early spring queen, founding her initial nest in the spring, building up the colony over the summer, producing new daughters who help forage and tend the nest, and then newly produced queens and males at the end of the season, leaving the nest and mating. And those new mating queens build up energy stores on fall forage, like what's blooming right now, goldenrods, asters up here in the Northeast, um, and then finding a suitable site for overwintering. Bumblebees live on an annual cycle, so the old queen will die and the new queens will overwinter in these hibernacula, which are short burrows in the soil, often on northern sloped areas or under trees, under leaf litter. So they can be very shallow and almost at the soil surface. And I have a little video here. This is the new queen of a common Eastern bumblebee excavating a hibernaculum under a thin layer of leaf litter and pine needles. You can see it's, it's pretty shallow and she's able to get down in there and find a place to spend the winter. So all of those insects and spiders need habitat and most of them are using leaf litter or standing vegetation to complete their life cycles. So many invertebrates rely on fallen leaves. So if, I, if you came to this program thinking I was gonna give you a ton of homework for your garden, I actually have pretty great news for you. In the large part, I'm gonna tell you to do less, do less to do more. So the best way to conserve this part of the life cycle for this animal food web is to leave the, leave the leaves, at least some of them, to provide overwintering habitat for pollinators and other beneficial insects. So we can talk a lot more about how to do that, the leaves don't necessarily need to be left exactly where they fall in order to be able to provide some cover and overwintering habitat. Um, if you have areas of grass, a thick layer of leaves can smother those grass. So if you wanna keep some areas open, you can rake them or otherwise corral them into your garden beds around your tree bases or some other designated areas where they can, where they can suppress weeds and retain moisture like a mulch, uh, a living mulch. If you're wanting to protect the insects and eggs that might already be present with the leaf litter, uh, you will want to leave some standing where it is. 
And I would, I would definitely caution you to avoid shredding leaves with a mower. Um, raking is going to keep, keep leaves whole uh, for the best cover and protect, to some extent, the insects and eggs already living there. Um, so that's, that's going to be your gentlest option if you have to move leaves. Blowing is a little bit less gentle, but does still keep leaves whole. So you could think about that as maybe a step down from raking, which is a step down from leaving them totally undisturbed. But all of these are a step up from mowing and bagging um, and removing the leaves from your yard altogether. Doug Tallamy's group, Homegrown National Park, has a great social media presence. And these are some of the ideas they suggest for ways that you could use leaves. You can leave them when you, where they fall. You can rake them into a light layer around garden beds or pile around trees to make new beds. Mulch around shrubs and perennials, use them as a layer of carbon material in your active composting pile, or pile up for passive composting or leaf jumping fun. So lots of different ideas for what you could do with leaves. And as far as mulch goes, this is sort of a, a second question we get a lot. So I would say go easy on mulch. Mulch can be a very useful tool for weed control and keeping moisture around your plants. Um, but thick and heavy layers of mulch, especially you know thick wood mulch, can limit nesting sites for ground nesting bees. So when we do mulch, we want to do so lightly. So this is an example of sort of a light layer of mulch where you have some ground nesting bees that are still able to get into the soil surface. Um, or if you're used to using wood mulch, you could mulch the first foot of beds um, to help with encroaching weeds, but then leave some soil bare in the interior of beds or at the back of beds to help uh, keep those areas open for bees to nest in. The leaf litter that we've, we're talking about leaving uh, is, or bringing into our garden beds is really its own mulch. So you could also you know, just consider using leaf litter as mulch and then maybe reverse mulch with the, with the wood chip mulch. Use, use the wood chips to mulch walking paths between beds. Like all the messy looking practices that we are recommending, if you're living in a neighborhood that has um, a more typical sort of HOA aesthetic with a lot of neighbors managing their yards in a more traditional way, it can be helpful to provide signage that explains what you're doing. Uh, so people passing by who have questions or get concerned have something to look at and explain what you're up to. Um, I think more of us every year have heard about leave the leaves, know something about it, but it's still a new concept in some places. So keep the leaves where you can and then tell people why you're doing it. So that's a small introduction to leaving the leaves, which really has been a bit of a paradigm shift for many gardeners. Putting gardens to bed for pollinators is actually a lot less work than the way we might have learned how to clean up garden beds before. Do you want to spend hours bagging leaves? Me neither. So guess what? Pollinators and other insects and wildlife will be happier in a messy winter garden. So I'm going to turn to talking about the second part of fall and winter management of pollinator gardens, which is saving the stems. So if you've attended our other webinars on pollinators or read up on the lives of, ground, of our native bees, this is going to be uh, old hat to you. But it's always good to talk about biology when we're thinking about how to manage um, these insects. So we have about 4,000 species of native wild living bees in the United States. There's tremendous diversity among these species. Um, most of them live in the soil, but about 30% nest in plants, so stems and wood. And then a small number are bumblebees nest in cavities, which is um, you know, places like abandoned rodent burrows and grassy fields or compost piles. So for those bees that live above ground in plants, so stems and tunnels and wood, um, these are some of the types of bees that do that. We've got small carpenter bees, ceratina. Um, we've got hyleus, mass face bees, osmia, our mason bees, and our leaf cutter bees. So the hyleus and the ceratina, small carpenter bees and yellow face bees, these are really tiny bees that live in small above, above ground stems. Mason and leaf cutter bees live in somewhat larger, uh, larger cavities, tunnel nesters. This is an example of what ceratina nests look like. These are those tiny little metallic green blue bees. They're in the same family as uh, carpenter bees and honeybees and bumblebees, but they look quite a bit different. Um, they nest in pithy plant stems. So things like elderberry and blueberry and sumac canes. They'll live in bee balm stems. They'll live in anise hyssop. That center picture is a bee excavating a stem nest. So that's last year's growth that was cut off in spring. 
And these bees are, are, um, are called carpenter bees, but they're not wood boring bees. They're really, they need the soft pith to be exposed uh, in these plants. So, so the female bee will start digging down and then start provisioning the base of the tunnel with pollen and nectar that she's gathered from plants. And then um, she will use the woody pith to make a little partition in the nest and then repeat the pollen and nectar provisioning for another egg, make another wall and continue until she's filled up that stem with pollen and nectar provisions, eggs um, and, and little walls between them. Some species of bees also nest in wood. So standing snags and logs and brush piles can actually be an important contributor to nesting and overwintering habitat. Some wood nesting bees can chew cavities with their jaws, but a lot of them actually depend on other insects, boring beetles for their nest cavities. So dead wood and wood boring insects are two things that we tend to wanna to get rid of, but they're actually really important for these bees and other insects. You might have boring beetles, but that means you may also have interesting bees. <laughs> Logs are providing resources for insects during all stages of their decomposition process. This is the metallic green sweat bee, Agachlora pura, which is a native solitary wood nesting bee that nests in decaying or rotting wood. And it is just such a beautiful bee. And do you wanna see this bee in your yard? You have to keep that rotting log around to see some of these beautiful little bees. So many of you might have come to this with questions about leaving the leaves and saving the stems. And we especially get a lot of questions about the whole process of how you save the stems. Leaving the leaves can be pretty self-explanatory, but um, saving the stems, when do I cut back? What do I cut back? What the heck do I do? Let's walk through the process of creating habitat for stem nesting bees. It's actually not that hard to do once you get kind of used to the annual ritual. So here we are at September, start of the fall. What are we going to do right now? Right now, we're not going to do anything. We're going to leave new growth of flower stalks intact over the winter. Did it put out a flower head this year? We're going to let it be. So in this case, doing less is doing more to save the bees. In the spring, we are going to cut back the plant growth from last year. So I'm not expecting, I think I said that those serotina bees, the little stem nesters, they're not gonna excavate their way in through fresh, you know, the exterior of a stem. They need that stem to be open so that they can get at the pith, which is easier for them to excavate. So next spring, we're gonna be cutting back this year's new growth. So typically bees are nesting in the older growth, the dried out plant stems, not the new growth. So you're going to be opening up these stems for bees in the spring for small carpenter bees and other stem nesters to find. But female bees will find those open cut stems and then start their nest there. So you want to leave a variety of heights. Uh, we, we provide a range of, you know, eight to 24 inches. Just leave, they are sort of still standing, but you've cut the flower heads off and opened up the stem and that's going to provide some nest cavities. You don't want to take it all the way to the ground because then there's there's no stem left to nest in. So over the summer next year, you're going to have new growth of the perennial and that's going to hide the stem stubble that you just cut down um, and bee larvae will be developing in their nest in those cut dead, dead standing stems. In fall of next year, you will again leave that new growth standing that has seed heads on it. Bees are gonna be hibernating in the cut dead stems that you did um, in the spring over the winter. And other insects and birds are gonna be using those standing plants and seed heads for, for food and shelter. The spring after that, you are again gonna cut back that new growth. Um, and the old stems where the bees were hibernating are gonna to start to naturally decompose at this point. So you don't wanna trim those back unless you're really feeling desperate about it. Adult bees are gonna emerge from those old cut stems and start nests in newly cut dead stems or in other naturally occurring open stems. So I hope that all made sense. We can talk about it more. You can look at our, our resource on, on habitat for stem nesting bees, but that's kind of the annual ritual. Right now, we're not doing anything. Uh, in the spring, you can cut back the, the new growth from this year. That's, that's when to think about it. You can usually find two-year-old cut stalks if you try, but you really shouldn't have to re remove them for aesthetic reasons because they will start to break down and they're going to get covered by next year's perennial growth. 
So here are some of the preferred nesting plants in, in the Northeast to, to Midwest, some plants in the mint family like hyssop and bee balm, some in the aster family like coneflower, sunflower, goldenrods, and some berry plants and shrubs are all highly used plants when there are open stems available. Not all of these are gonna be native to your area. I don't know where you're all coming from. Uh, we do have new and updated plant lists on our website that have regional native plants. They're longer than some of our old plant lists and they have a little icon that tells you if a species can be used as a preferred stem nesting plant. So I would recommend you go to the Xerces Pollinator Conservation Resource Center and check out those new plant lists to find some stem nester plants for your area. The great thing about Doing nothing at this time of year is that you get this year-round appeal of winter, winter cover. These plants that you've left standing are providing cover and structure and winter forage for birds and other wildlife. Shrubs and trees that, that are maintaining their leaves through the winter as well can provide some cover from wind and rain and snow. Um, and fruits and seeds provide food into the winter months for other wildlife. And I really think that, that leaving stem standing can add a lot of winter interest and beauty. So I wouldn't think of a winter garden as being barren and lifeless. These seasons can really be a time of beauty um, and year round appeal when you're looking at them. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and we'll talk about fall garden tasks and some exceptions to leaving the leaves. So while it's largely beneficial to leave foliage in place through the winter, removing plant material in the fall um, should be done for perennials that have disease issues or insect pest issues during the summer, both in your, in your pollinator beds and in your um, garden. So there, there is a difference between cleaning up a perennial wildflower bed and cleaning up your garden that has edible plants in it. Fall cleanup is a port, an important part of breaking pest and disease cycles in the vegetable garden where a lot of those plants really can harbor a lot of diseases and the plant material over the winter and then bring them back into the garden next year. So I do wanna be clear that that is a place where it makes total sense to remove all the leaves and stems and fruits and other plant parts after you get your first killing frost. So a lot of edible plants, yeah, the overwinter on the, on the plant debris and in increase impact in the next year. Compost, um, generally speaking, unless you're an active manager of your compost, uh, your, your passive compost pile is generally not hot enough to deal with some of those disease issues. So um, unless you have a compost pile that gets up to about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So some municipal composts um, will accept your, your home garden material and that's a great option if you're able to do that. Um, but just recognize that uh, if you are doing a home passive compost pile, uh, that might not be enough to deal with the pathogens that you, are, you have in your vegetable garden. When it comes to native plants, less is more when it comes to management, but that's really not the case for edible plants. So for something like a backyard apple tree, it is important to pay attention to pruning and nutrition and other cultural practices. This is the example from my own backyard of you just really wanna keep the area around the tree clean and free of fallen fruit and leaves and woody debris that you might've pruned out of it in order to, to deal with those pests and disease cycles. So if you don't, you don't wanna bend over or get down on your hands and knees to collect apple drops, this is the solution that I use, which is a golf ball collector. You just roll it right over the ground and all those dropped apples pop right in there. You do have to kind of stay on top of it because it doesn't work once those apples start decomposing and turning into a slushy mess. So it is best to stay on top of it, but this is an easy solution that I found for um, making the job go faster. And that will help basically to reduce inoculum and overwintering pests and other diseases because apples just have a whole suite of things that love, um, that love them um, that will injure your trees over time if you let them. The other things you can do to break uh, disease cycles in your garden, and this is a great time of year to take on cleaning and disinfecting of garden tools and plant supports. So you can use a 10% bleach solution that helps disinfect and sterilize those tools so that you're not bringing the pathogens back next year into your garden. Um, clean your tools like shovels and pruners and trowels, just wash them off. Um, and then you can use that 10% that bleach solution and dry them off with a towel and then you'll be ready for next year. Another thing to consider at this time of year is thinking about crop rotation for next year, changing the planting location that can help break disease cycles within plant families, thinking about not planting, you know, 
eggplants, peppers, potatoes, tomatoes, all part of the same family, often have some, some shared diseases like uh, or funguses like early blight can affect all those different crops. And it survives in plant debris in the soil and on seeds. So that disease is best prevented by crop rotation and garden cleanup in the fall. Again, distinctions between what's happening in your vegetable garden and what's happening in your, your pollinator beds. But in terms of the going back to pollinator beds, there is a rhythm to tending a native landscape that becomes sort of a familiar and comfortable ritual. So you wanna stay on top of weeding in the fall, both in your vegetable garden and in your pollinator beds before those weeds go to seed and produce hundreds of new weeds that you don't want in your yard or garden next year. On the flip side of that, the fall is a great time to collect seeds for the plants that you do want in your yard. And you can absolutely collect and store and grow out native seeds from your property. It's a very enjoyable process, can provide you with pretty low cost plants. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a process that involves incremental growth. So this photo is containers of native seed that I've collected from plants in my coworker's yard. Um, and most collected seeds dry out in the house once your, your heat is on, which helps prevent rotting. And then you can store them in paper lunch bags and then sow outdoors in the fall after some killing frosts or early in the spring. So if you're, there's a lot, you can, a lot more you can talk about in terms of um, protocols for seed collection. You don't really have to worry about that when you're just collecting from plants that you already have. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about how you could wild collect seed, I would recommend that you look up the um, BLM Seeds of Success program, which has native seed collection protocols and guidance to help collection. In your vegetable garden, again, fall is a good time to plant cover crops. Uh, or add amendments like manure or leaves or compost, um, disease-free garden waste. Cover crops like this clover can help protect the soil from erosion and compaction, retain nutrients, um, and, and provide some weed suppression for the next, next season. And then compost also you know, add organic matter and, and generally improve soil health. One thing that I didn't know as a sort of young starting gardener was that fall is often a great time to plant as well. I always assumed that spring was just the time to plant, but in some places fall is actually the best time to plant, uh, and especially you know perennials and trees and shrubs. In your in your perennial uh, in your garden beds, it's a good time for planting perennial herbs and garlic, and then around the yard, this is the great time to plan and plant for pollinators. Also, if you've you know, been working on prepping an area for seeding a meadow, so if you've spent this summer sheet mulching or um, using all kinds of different site preparation methods to prepare an area for planting, up here in the northern part of the country, fall into winter is a good time to seed perennial wildflowers. Dormant seeding, where seeds kind of sit out in the winter through frost and then freeze and thaw cycles can help a lot of those prairie species that we have in our, our perennial pollinator beds break dormancy and germinate in the spring. That dormant season is also the time of year that I spend a lot of time reflecting on gardens and making plans for next year, thinking about what worked well this year, what plants or arrangement of plants struggled? Why did they struggle? Was it a moisture problem? Was it lack of sunlight? Was it airflow? They're too close together. Plants as they mature can grow very fast and get rid of, you know, they no longer have enough space. So I start to think about where I'm going to move plants around to give them a better chance next year. I also think about what's missing in my garden. So is there a time of year, thinking about year-round appeal for pollinators, is there a time of year where my garden isn't really offering something for pollinators that I could think about filling in next year? Could I plant another butterfly host plant, offer something new? My approach to pollinator gardening is really slow and continuous improvement, kind of like planning for retirement. Yes, it would be great to do a huge lump sum and plant everything right at the outset, but that's a big outlay and I don't have the resources to do that. So instead I aim to do just a little bit more every year, incremental improvement. We have guides that can help kind of assess where those gaps might be. So if you're struggling to figure out what you could do in your garden next year, these are some options, this habitat assessment guides for yards and gardens and parks 
are relatively easy to use and they kind of help you zero in on what you might be missing, whether it's nesting habitat or floral resources. In terms of that year round appeal that I'm talking about, then again, the habitat assessment guides can help you zero in on this. But this is, uh, this is something where planting for diversity means planting for resilience. So there are these kind of critical periods um, that are even more affected by, by shifting climate. So in the early spring, which is a vulnerable period for emerging bees, the early diet can really drive growth of colonies of bumblebees. The quantity and quali quality of pollen collected in the early spring really drives what's happening in bumblebee colonies through the season. A good start can really help win the race. It's also a vulnerable time because of variability in weather conditions. So this is all to sort of support the idea of let's plant more types of plants at this time of year, early spring and in fall, um, so that we, we have some fallbacks when you have a weird early spring warm up and a hard freeze, something else will start blooming soon in your yard. Um, in the fall too, the overwintering success of mated bumblebee queens ends up depending on the energy stores that they build up from fall forage. So having a really good variety of resources available for them as they're getting their fat stores built up and ready to get their hibernaculum set up, um, we wanna have things available for them at this time of year as well. So floral resource planning, really good to have as much diversity as possible early spring and fall on those sort of shoulder seasons when bees are first coming out and thinking about going into the ground for the winter. There are a couple more things I wanted to mention in terms of fall and winter garden tasks. Um, this can actually be a good time of year to interrupt some pest life cycles. So if you're in the Northeast, uh, you might be familiar with the invasive insect spotted lanternfly. And this is the time of year that they're laying eggs. So egg masses can be found on a variety of different outdoor surfaces uh, from trees to patio chairs, um, other stuff outside from October to June. Um, and they kind of look like if you take uh, a piece of bubble gum and just like smack it on a surface. So if you've ever tried to, to catch and squish a lanternfly in the summertime, you know that they are this big, fast moving insect. Um, so really the part of their life cycle that is easiest to interrupt is the one where they are not moving. And winter is the best time to seek out and scrape off these egg masses drop them into a little Ziploc with some hand sanitizer and throw them out and not think about them again. So this is, this is the time of year to be thinking about um, this particular insect, um, knowing that they're just very difficult to do anything about when they are out and very mobile. Similarly, fall can be a time to think about invasive plant management. If you have you know, a large acreage and you're dealing with different invasive plants, every species is a little bit different, but this is the time of year that plants are bringing resources back into their roots. So for some of them, it can be a good time to interrupt that life cycle. Um, fall is often when natural areas managers are looking to make targeted use of herbicides for species that are very challenging to manage mechanically, like Japanese knotweed. So this would be a, a time of year when that species is bringing resources back to its root and a, a targeted application can help break that cycle. But like all other management, we want to make sure you know exactly what species you're dealing with and have looked into the best available management options so that you know what you're doing. You want to make, always match management and timing of management to the particular species that you're, you're dealing with. So we're getting close to wrapping up. Just a quick recap here on fall cleanup. What we do want you to do, we do want you to clean up disease and insect affected plants, clean up your vegetable garden and plants in your perennial beds that have diseases or insect pests that are likely to overwinter and come back again next year in the plant residues. We don't want to clean up healthy perennials and grasses and leaves. We wanna leave stems standing over the winter, let the birds have them and let the insects live their lives. So let's just take a few, a few slides to reflect at the end of this. Thinking about our intentions for gardens can help decide how we wanna manage, how we wanna intervene. Are we trying to conserve insects and create wildlife habitat? Are you dependent on fruits and vegetables you're growing for food or profit? Are you trying to maintain a certain aesthetic that brings you joy? So when I think about my own yard, I really have three goals. One is to conserve and support a diversity of insects and birds and other wildlife living around me. 
Two, I want to create a beautiful space that I enjoy watching in the mornings with my coffee in my hand. And three, given that I have a toddler and a busy life, one of my goals is really to manage land with little effort as possible. I want a, a system that is healthy and functional that I can manage very lazily. <laughs> So with all of those goals, goals in mind, it's a lot easier for me to accept some untidiness in my garden and even to love and appreciate and enjoy wild spaces in there. So if you're used to mowing and bagging and cleaning, or even just used to lawn, moving to that messy garden can take a shift in perspective. I have this patch of goldenrod and coneflower and stinging nettles and hairy white aster outside my kitchen window. And my husband looks out there and thinks, well, that looks kind of terrible. Do you want me to clean that up? And my response is almost always just wait, take a minute and just watch. What do you see happening in there? Can you see movement? Do you see the finches that just landed on the coneflower? Do you see the late season bumblebees on the aster and the goldenrod? What is there that you might not see that's hidden in that thatch and under the soil? Let's leave it be. And so, so far that's, that's been working. And remember, you, you really don't need to do it all at once. Every gardener will continue tinkering and making incremental improvements. You can work on it in easy to do chunks. Set this aside for next year. Let's work on this little, little area. And take some time to enjoy what you've created. See what works. It's always a fun experiment of trial and error to figure out what's gonna grow, where are bees gonna nest, what plants are really the high value ones that are giving you that amazing hum and buzz in your garden. And with that shift in perspective, you can really come to enjoy the signs of life that might have led you to make an intervention before. You know, you're putting out food for wildlife. You can let them eat that. The garden is going to be chewed up. It's going to get munched up. It's going to get nested in, dug out, burrowed in. It's going to have a lived in kind of look. So we might as well get used to that. And even better, pull up your chair, bring your coffee, and watch what's happening. So instead of saying, hey, there's a caterpillar, crap, there's a caterpillar eating my plants, let me grab the spray. I say, what caterpillar is that? Let me pull out iNaturalist and figure it out. What's that caterpillar going to become? Oh, look, look at that beautiful furry moth that it's gonna become. I can't wait to see that later. So with all this in mind, knowing that insecticides will harm the life in your garden, isn't that the life that you're trying to encourage? So at all times of the year, definitely encourage you to look for signs of nature active and dormant in our yards. Because remember, if we want butterflies in our gardens, we need caterpillars in our gardens. And if we want birds in our gardens, we need insects in our gardens. So if we want resilience, we need diversity in our gardens. If we plant lots of different early blooming species, that's going to help ensure that if we have that early warm up and hard freeze in the spring, something else is going to bloom shortly after. If we plant a mix of locally adapted plants when there's drought, there's a drought adapted species that's ready to provide pollen and nectar in the middle of the summer heat. That's resilience. So if we are planting diverse, deep rooted perennial species, like the prairie plants that a lot of us are planting for pollinators, those deep-rooted plants can withstand damage from something like the invasive jumping worm in ways that shallow-rooted lawn grasses can't do. That's resilience too. So resilience in our garden often means, you know, once we've planted those perennials, it means doing less and not more, allowing these natural processes to unfold, intervening less, and creating gardens that embrace and support the life cycles of insects across the changing seasons. So we covered a lot of different things, a lot of different topics today. So if you are interested in going deeper on any particular topic, Xerces has a ton of free resources on plants and pollinators and other insects. So I would check out the Pollinator Conservation Resource Center on our website, and it has those updated regional plant lists that, that give you that little icon on what system nesting plant, uh, along with other great information on, on whether they're a host plant for larval butterflies, et cetera. This is a fact sheet that we have, 12 page fact sheet with all of the info you might want on nesting and overwintering habitat, including the info that I covered today on plant stem management. So if you wanna go back and refer to that, that's a great resource to have. And then finally, we're a donor supported nonprofit and membership funding is what allows me to take on this type of outreach presentation. So 
donors can receive a pollinator habitat sign along with their membership to Circe's or a leave the leaf sign. So just thank you again to all of the supporters and members out there. We really appreciate you. So with that, I will end here and say thank you for coming and joining me to talk about fall gardening for pollinators and resilient gardening, and I will take questions. Thank you so much, Emily. That was wonderful. Uh, we have so many good questions coming in, so I'm just going to dive right in. Um, you're getting lots of thanks in the chat, by the way. People really appreciated your presentation. Just as a reminder, if you did put a question in the chat, please put it in the Q&A um, icon. It's really hard for us to keep track of all the questions in chat. Um, there's no organizational process to it, so the Q&A just helps us. I don't know if we're going to get to all of these. We're going to go a little over time today if you can stick with us. If not, this is recorded and will be on our YouTube channel, probably posted today or tomorrow. So we have a lot of questions about timing, and we just talked about this before <laughs> the webinar started. Um, Mary, for example, lives in Southern California and said that she's a little bit afraid to touch anything because everything seems busy year round and that their summer is actually sort of their winter when it's really hot and dry and native plants go dormant. Do you have any like signs for people to look for? We say things like spring or fall, but of course, depending on where you are in the country, that can be so varied and even year to year. So what are the things you look for in your garden to know if there is activity and when is a good time? Any tips you might have for the, for the audience? Yeah, I realize, of course, that I have a very Northeastern bias in the way that I present this information because that is the, the system that I'm, I'm really familiar with. Um, and I think in a place like California, again, it is, it is a matter of um, being observant of the activity that's in your yard to recognize when things are active and, and, and present. Um, so I think that the advice there is going to be a little bit different in terms of when to intervene um, and if to intervene. Um, so I think in those cases, you're looking for um, the timing of when particular stem nesting bees, for example, would be active or coming out. So if you can and learn to figure out when the flight periods are for something that's a stem nesting bee would be in your yard, like that's when you're seeing them on your flowers. Just before that period would be to look for a time when you could open up the stems of plants that they can use for nesting. So, you know, I think about that with my own plants. I have stem nesting bees like Serotina that are coming out. Um, for me in the Northeast, it would be uh, late spring into early summer. And that's when I'm opening up my bee balm stems so that they can nest in them. Um, so the growth from last year, um, that's when I would, would cut that back and, and think about um, opening them up. Again, you're probably not gonna be damaging um, uh, bees in a newly grown stem because it's unlikely they're going to be in a newly grown stem. It needs to dry out a bit for them to and be opened up for them to access it. I hope that's helpful. It is different up here than it is in California. Yeah, it's hard when you're a nationwide organization trying to recommend for, for every area um, can be difficult. All right, so this next person um, says mulching and mowing leaves into turf is recommended for adding organic matter and an environmentally sound option for helping to manage soil health. Would you recommend not using this practice as, at all to protect pollinators or would it be okay on some smaller scale or using in conjunction with raking whole leaves into certain places? I think the last of those sounds great. So raking whole leaves into your garden beds. And then, you know, if you have areas of, uh, of lawn that you're wanting to maintain, you can, you can take some fraction of your leaves and, and mulch them in there to maintain soil health. Again, everything that we do here is really on a spectrum of, uh, of available activities. So uh, you're, if you're raking some of your whole leaves into garden beds, you are protecting some portion of your pollinators and other beneficials that are going to use that habitat. Um, so that's, that's a great step to take. Thank you. We have a few questions um, specifically about jumping worms. And mm. he, for example, loves leaf litter. And then they found jumping worms <laughs> this year. And so they're wondering how to handle that situation. So. I have, I just discovered jumping worms in my own garden this year, so I'm sorry. <laughs> it's sort of a natural, um, a natural, na because I didn't know to look for jumping worms until just really this past year when it became more evident that they're in Vermont. Um, 
I didn't know all of the steps that you can take to prevent jumping worms from getting into your yard in the first place. So really they're coming in in mulch, they're coming in in transplants from nurseries. Um, so the best thing that you can do is to really monitor what you're bringing in and prevent them in the first place. If they are already in your yard, um, there's really not much you can do to, the, the, it's not feasible um, to eradicate them from your yard. Um, you could probably put in the effort in, you know, picking them out from raised beds or container planters, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, once they're in your yard, the, the things that you could try to eradicate them with are going to harm other beneficial organisms in the soil, including our ground nesting bees. So it's not likely to effectively control jumping worms and it's gonna, gonna harm other species. So I think, I think the good news is that one of the management techniques suggested for jumping worms is really planting those deep-rooted prairie species. So those are, are, because they're growing roots so far into the soil, they're able to withstand the impacts of jumping worms in the higher areas of the topsoil. Um, so our pollinator gardens and our meadows might be a good option for kind of resilient gardening in the face of jumping worms. But I'm sorry that you're dealing with jumping worms. They, they really can change the whole system. Well, thank you. So this is a question we get a lot. Donna's wondering the cut stems are vertical. Um, we often think about like Mesa bee houses, for example, they're not vertical, but naturally they are vertical when you cut um, the stems. But when it rains, will that damage those nests that are laid inside of there? I I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I think I think um, it's possible that a really hard rain event could damage some um, you know stem nesting bees, but I also think that that's going to that's going to affect much more than our stem nesting bees in ways that we can't control, right? We had so much flooding here in Vermont this year, and I imagine that it had really uh, negative impacts on ground nesting bees in a lot of areas of the state. And actually, the stem nesting bees are probably more protected from what happened here over the summer um, because they're out of the ground. So I think there's always going to be some some winners and some losers with natural disasters um, and with with just regular regular rainfall, but these bees have been around for um, a long time and, and are used to living with some level of, of rainfall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. We did just record our podcast with Leif Richardson, and this is such a common question, and it's about ground nesting bees, and a lot of bees actually secrete like a waterproof um, material that they use, so, you know, sometimes they do get flooded, but then, like you've said, they've been around, they've thought about this, and yeah, I don't think there's much we can do about it. Right. Yeah, some, some bees actually live in riparian areas um, and can really withstand inundation of their nests. Um, bees that pollinate um, loose strife, some of the, the native loose strife species live in riverbanks and have really great moisture protection of their nests. But a lot of bees don't have quite that level of moisture protection. It's cool that they do that though. It's so interesting. Um, Lisa, hi Lisa, she's in the Northeast and is wondering about milkweed stems and although they seem to be hollow and pithy, she doesn't see them on lists. Um, so wondering if bees use them or not due to latex toxicity. That's a great question. I do cut my milkweed stems and leave them open. I don't know that I've actually seen bees using them, but um, I do leave them open just in case. So I, I don't know whether, whether the latex toxicity might affect bees in that way. I would imagine once it's all dried out, maybe not, but I also haven't seen a lot of bees in my milkweed stems. <laughs> well, that's a great observation. Um, this person has a good question. So they just moved into a new house that has a lot of pine trees along one of their sides of the house. Are pine needles good cover for insects as the needles are acidic? So should they leave the needles or should they pick them up? I would leave the needles. Um, there are a lot of bumblebees. So if you, if you remember the little video I showed of the bumblebee excavating its hibernacula, that was a lot of, a lot of pine needles around. Um, and I did part of my master's research on bee nesting. Um, and we put out basically these pop-up tents, these emergence traps to capture bees emerging from the ground and try and figure out where they were nesting. And a ton of bumblebees and other bee species uh, nest in the woods, in sort of like open canopy woods in early spring. And so they'll definitely excavate their way down around pine needles into the duff. So I would just leave them be, oh, bees, will, bees will make it work. I loved that video, that bumblebee is so cute. <laughs> Glad you included that. 
All right. Um, someone was wondering, Marlene is asking the site you referenced for seed collection information. I wasn't able to put that in the chat, um, but if you can remind me, I can. Carve yeah, it. Bureau, the Bureau of Land Management Seeds of Success. It's basically a protocol for seed collection that's more ethical based on sort of a, the valuable population of a wild, um, a wild population of a plant so that you're not over collecting seeds of a wild population. Oh, okay, perfect. I can see Carly searching for it. So <laughs> she's usually pretty on it. I'm sure she'll get it in the chat. Thank you, Carly. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that. Lots of good questions. Uh, Emily, Emily has a compost tumbler and is currently using dead leaves as brown matter. Is there a good part of the year to collect leaves for their compost so that they don't disturb insect eggs? Hmm. That's a good question. I think probably you're going to have some level of insect activity in leaves year round. So um, you, you can take your pick of when you pull those leaves for composting. Um, but I don't, I think there's going to be some level of, a, of an insect life cycle present in leaves at any given time of the year. So there's not one better time than another that I can think of. Lots of people ask that question. <laughs> I guess the answer is when you need, you know, carbon in your composting cycle. All right, here, this is a little, um, it's topic adjacent. <laughs> Michelle is wondering, um, they watch native bees making nests between young tomato plants in their bed of their vegetable box in the spring. How deep on average are these nests and how do they avoid disturbing them when they use the beds in the following spring? Oh, that's a good question. So generally speaking, bumblebee nests are going to be pretty shallow. So some bees, you know, solitary ground nesting bees can go anywhere from five centimeters down to a meter into the ground. So some bees where they have a nest entrance up top, they're going to be way below the soil surface. But a bumblebee generally isn't... Um, a huge excavator. A lot of times they're using um, they're using an existing cavity. Um, so when they're excavating their own nest in kind of a light and aerated soil, like a garden bed, they're not going to go down very far. They might only be a few inches under the soil surface. Um, how not to disturb them? And maybe just you know pay attention to when that site goes dormant uh, because they're not going to be overwintering necessarily in that same cavity. Um, the new queens are going to leave and find new places to, to hibernate for the winter. And so, uh, you know, after the fall, that's probably going to be a dormant cavity and not, not in use. So this question um, is one that I've gotten from people about ticks specifically, if they're worried about ticks in their backyard with leaving the leaves. Do you have any suggestions um, for any tick management, especially people that have um, pets? Yeah, so ticks are a challenge. Um, you know, I think it's with with um, with ticks. It's really about um, the the times of year when they are most active, which is right now um, in the fall. So it's a in terms of management right now when you're doing this kind of uh, raking leaves into your beds. Um, I would just wear, you know, personal protection and do tick checks for this time of year. In general, the other, you know, the next sort of active period is when the young nymphs are doing like active seeking in the spring and they'll walk up tall vegetation and, and seek a new host. Um, and so one thing to be just pay attention to is when you have kind of overhanging vegetation and you brush by it and that's when you'll you'll pick up a tick. One of the things that I've seen recommended for sort of cultural management of ticks is if you're concerned about them kind of coming out of your um, forest edges or garden beds, you can do some mulching, like thick mulching uh, with big wood chips to do to try and um, break that cycle of when the, the, tymphs are act, the nymphs are actively seeking a host, um, that there's like a two or three foot wide mulch line between mm -hmm. your yard recreational area and your forest edge, for example, so that those ticks, you know, if that vegetation bends down and there's a nymph at the end of it, they're landing on a wood chip where they might get a little bit baked rather than that they're, they're landing on another vegetation that they could then use to keep moving. Anyway, it's it's I don't know how effective that is. I've seen it recommended as a cultural management. Um, the other option is is that I always see recommended is is have backyard chickens. 
<laughs> I love that idea. Or guinea fowl. Apparently they're very effective or at least very, um, they love ticks. They love eating ticks. Unfortunately, don't like eating jumping worms. Oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> All right, um, we have a little bit more time here. So Beth and a few other people are wondering about issues they've had with rodent or vole pressure. Um, so when they put in new native plants or shrubs that they've planted, then they have root damage due to those rodents. So do you have any suggestion suggestions, and this is specific when they leave the leaf litter around these plants? I'd have to look up what to do about rodent and vole pressure. Uh, generally, I like having rodents around because it means that there's some kind of cavity for a bumblebee to nest in, but that is a uh, personal preference. I know that's not everybody's preference. So I'm not I'm not exactly sure what the best management is for, for voles. All right, Lori is wondering, this is a question we get a lot from people. She has an HOA <laughs> and they hate leaves aside from changing the bylaws, uh, which they're working on. Thank you, Lori. Um, they try to move all of their leaves to their garden beds, but wondering how deep they can pile the leaves and not harm overwintering insects. I think you can go, you can go pretty thick. Um, but again, it's as long as you're able to save some, some fraction of the leaves from your yard, you're able, you know, you're saving that fraction of beneficial insects overwintering in that leaf litter. So thank you for, for making the attempt to save some of the leaves rather than have them bagged up and taken away by the HOA. Um, and thank you also for working on the bylaws, because I know that that is a huge challenge for a lot of you. Um, I don't know exactly what the, what the amount would be, but, um, you know, the, you can also put them in a leaf pile somewhere and some, you know, I don't think it's going to harm those insects to have them in a big, big leaf pile. Thank you. A lot of people ask that. And also um, Michael made a comment that they've been getting a lot of organizations to say leaf life instead of leaf litter, which kind of changes the perspective. I like that. <laughs> I like that too. That's great. Thank you. We might steal that. <laughs> um, a couple of people are also asking about whether bees will nest in stems that have dropped onto the ground or if they have to remain vertical. So I would I would keep the stems of plants that have dropped to the ground. I think um, generally I see more activity in stems that are still standing from things like serotina, but I think they will also use what's available to them. So if there's not a standing plant stem available, you know, a lot of plants will drop to the ground naturally. Um, and I think you can just either leave them where they fall, or if you if you need to clean that up, you know, gather them up and, and put them in a pile somewhere, sort of like a brush pile around your yard. And if there is a stem nesting bee that's looking for a nest and hasn't found anything else, it's gonna use um, a fallen stem. So they they can still be used on the ground. All right, Mary Rose, I'm, I'm going to ask this question because I know her and she lives here in Missoula, Montana. Um, hi, Mary Rose. She's wondering, um, oaks are non-native to this area, but we do have a lot of Norway maples and other non-native trees kind of all over the streets here. And knowing that it's kind of an urban tree and they don't support a lot of insect communities, our communities are um, predominantly pine and Douglas fir forests. How would you suggest modifying or tailoring the Leave the Leaves message for Western areas such as ours that maybe we don't have as many um, of those? Hopefully that I- is, <laughs> Yeah, that's a great, a great question. Um, because I think, you know, as these invasive insects and plants and other things come to our area, it's gonna change the dynamics of what's happening in our, our yards. Um, so I guess I'd have to give that a little bit more thought. Um, but there are going to be insects that are that are using that habitat. Um, let me let me think about that one. It's raising a really good question for me around um, around that sort of dynamic of as new plants come to a place, what does it do to affect insect communities and how we manage them? That's a good question. All right, I think we have time for about one or two more. So Ruth is wondering, uh, for more than two years, they've used leaves as mulch in their garden beds. Now those beds need compost, which she plans to apply soon. Uh, will there will this timing harm any beneficial insects? Can you repeat that one? 
for Sorry. more than two years. Oh, no, it's fine. For more than two years, they've used the leaves as mulch in their garden beds. And now the garden beds need compost, which they want to apply soon, I'm assuming on top of the leaves. And they're just wondering if this would harm the beneficial insects if this timing would in the fall. Um, I think I think you would be okay to apply apply compost as an amendment. Um, yeah, I think you'd be okay. All right, um, I'm going to throw this question at you. <laughs> uh, Vicky's wondering about fire ants. They live mm. in Ontario and have created this small wood pile to provide habitat for various creatures, but it's infested with fire ants and they had to get rid of it, unfortunately, but didn't know if you had any suggestions for keeping them from coming back or any sort of natural solutions. Yeah, so fire ants are really a challenge. Um, I think that the key in fire ant management is prevention. Like so many things we talk about here, prevention-based pest management. So creating a yard space that is less inviting for fire ants with a lot of shade um, and practicing sanitation, like we talked about with the dropped apples, uh, removing dropped fruits that would be attractive to ants. And then when you do have active fire ant mounds, you know, there's a lot of different options out there. I still like the idea of probably boiling water as a, as a first line attempt. Boiling water doesn't always reach the queen of fire ants, but it is um, less likely to harm other insects than some of the other treatments that you might have available for fire ants. You know, some of the baits, um, you know, they're, they're effective, but there is some level of risk to birds and lizards and other wildlife from using those baits. Thank you. All right, we're going to end on this question. I think it's really pertinent, especially in the face of climate change, because we're seeing so much more wildfire. This person asks if we have any information on gardening for wildlife we're all, while also protecting our home, her home from the spread of wildfire, especially with leaf litter. That's something we have to think about now that we didn't um, before. Yeah, that again, this is this is an area that I don't have uh, totally in my wheelhouse. This is I, I mean, I don't live in an area with a lot of wildfires um, up here in the wet northeast. So I think I have to defer to some of our folks on the California team for thinking about that one. So if you want to follow up, uh, there may be folks on our California team who have been thinking about fire resistant landscaping. All right. Well, thank you so much, Emily. Um, if you didn't get your questions answered, please um, send us an email, um, ask your questions that way, and check out all the links that we send on our website for more information. Again, this um, recording will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, thank you so much, Emily. That was such great information. I learned a lot, and um, you're getting lots of comments in the chat saying thank you and how much folks have learned. So Happy fall, everyone, and thank you for being here today, and thank you for all of your efforts to help invertebrates and insects in your yard. You're all making a huge difference, so we appreciate it. All right, hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Carly, for being here, and thank you again, Emily. Thanks so much, everyone. Good luck gardening. <laughs> Bye.